What is my purpose? You just bumped the Shroud of Turin. Oh my god. Yeah, welcome to the club, pal. <laughs> oh, welcome back to another episode of Reason to Doubt, your source for all things skeptical. I'm Jared, and with me, as always, is Jordan. How's it going, Jared? It is going. I'm a bit tired. I'm sure you are as well, but... uh can't imagine why (laughs) (laughs) um we didn't realize when we said we were going to debunk the shroud of turin that it was going to be such an undertaking uh we thought one quick 30 to an hour long video and we'd be done uh but now we're on part two which is going to be a three-parter we have another part coming up next week so yep so in the first uh In the first episode, we focused on the dating of the Shroud, particularly the radiocarbon dating, because that's a big deal. And uh, this time, we're going to be talking about the image, you know, the thing the Shroud is famous for. We're going to talk about that and how that may or may not have gotten there. Yeah. So um, last time we started a new practice, we were doing our fallacy day at the end of the video. So make sure you stay to the very end so you can be educated on some fallacies. This one's a good one. Uh, But before we start, we want to make sure that we... um, we make a correction that in our last video, we had said that Sturp team had done the uh, the carbon dating on the shroud samples. And that's actually not the case. The uh, the carbon dating was overseen by the British Museum and then sent out to the labs that we mentioned. And so that's the actual process that it was. We just want to make sure that we didn't, we messed up and we realized that it wasn't the Sturp team doing it. And so. it's, it didn't affect any of our analysis. No. And uh, so that error and a couple other minor things are in a pinned comment on the video. This video will also have a pinned comment if any errors are pointed out. So if you think we messed up something, please do let us know in the comments. We want to know if we're wrong so we can fix it. And uh, But before you do, go check the pinned comment if there is one. We might have already got it. Uh, anyway, so <laughs> yeah. now that our... Oh, if <laughs> now if that you our make mistakes on this us, one too, yeah. uh, let us know. But we're not going to, I promise, guys. Okay. No mistakes. So now the mea culpa is done, let's get into this, the image formation. So uh, the image, uh, again, if you haven't seen part one for some reason, you jump into part two. Uh, the image is of a five foot, seven inch or 170 uh, centimeter tall dude. It's There's a picture of the shroud and it's front or ba- front and back. So the cloth is one continuous piece, but it's front and back as if the body had been like laying on one side and was wrapped over his head. Okay. So that's the image. Now, the STERP team, the guys who didn't do the radiocarbon dating, uh, uh, them and a bunch of other people <laughs> have analyzed the images over the years. And uh, there's some, I've kind of cobbled together various uh, characteristics of the image that we should keep in mind as we're moving forward. So for this, and again, all our references will be in the description. So if you want to check where we're getting our sources from, they'll all be there. So for this, I'm referencing Schwalb and Rogers in 1982 and also Fanti et al., um, the Microscopic and Microscopic Characteristics paper, again, in the description. So uh, some of these are going to sound like they're way into the weeds, but it's it, you have to understand the minutia of the way the image is in order to be able to uh, assess the different ways the image might have gotten made. If you don't understand all the ins and outs of what the image looks like, then something might seem plausible that act, actually doesn't work, right? So to start with, you'll hear a lot that the image is photo negative. Uh, sometimes, in fact, earlier today, just hours ago, someone told me that it couldn't be man-made because it was a photo negative and the photograph wasn't invented until the 19th century. So being photo negative doesn't mean it's a photograph. What it means is that the image is darker um, when it gets closer to the to the shroud, basically. The part that would normally be light is dark. It's kind of reversed. So if you actually, like my Google Docs is in dark mode, so all of my stuff is reversed. If you look at a negative of the shroud, you can actually see the guy a little easier uh, than you can if you're just looking at the brown. Um, the body parts that are closer to where the shroud would be draped on a body are darker. They have more coloring or whatever. That's all it means, okay? Also, uh, just because it's, looks like a photo negative doesn't mean it was meant to be a photo negative well it's not photo negative in the sense that someone took a photograph right like that's <laughs> yeah. not what it is what it is is that uh if you are like to draw somebody's face it's like you invert the colors and that's how you get this right uh so that's all that uh, means lithographs are done in this fashion uh when they take a, a wooden block and they carve out the negative so that way when well they carve out the positive so when they put the ink on it and stamp it it becomes yeah. a negative right? same thing you do with uh, screen printing Yes. Same thing. Uh, so it also has 3D encoded information. Okay. 
And that sounds very impressive and scary. What it means is that you can use how dark or light the image is to infer the distance on a body that would be draped in the shroud. So you can like use that information to construct a 3D image and you get something that looks kind of like the body like you'd expect. So basically, if you, if you use the hues to tell you uh, X and Y coordinates, then you'll get you'll get a model. Okay. Uh, Jackson and Jumper, 1978, they hypothesized that maybe like a statue or a model or even a corpse was likely used at some point during the creation of the shroud. And that would be an uh, easier way for them, whoever, however this was made, whether it's authentic or inauthentic, whatever, if it was actually draped on something human-like, it would be easier to get this kind of encoded information. So probably some body or facsimile of one was used at some point in, the, in, the, in whatever process made it. Uh, now we're getting into the actual image and like how it's constructed. So linen in general is made of cellulose. It's made of these plant fibers and they're woven together, right? So you've got the, the strands, which themselves are bundles of fibers, okay? The shroud linen threads are about uh, 0.15 millimeters in diameter. And those threads are themselves composed of fibers, which are 10 to 15 microns in diameter. Now, the discoloration for the Shroud of Turin affects only the outer two to three fibers of each thread. And it's a little hard to visualize if you haven't seen a picture. So this is a picture from Fanti in 2010. Um, and you can see the darkened circles there would be the individual fibers, the ones that are just 10 or 15 microns across. Um, and you can see it doesn't penetrate all the way through. So the image is very surface level. All right. Um, in, even further than just being on the outside fibers of each thread, the image is also only on the outside bits of the fiber, okay? So I use my amazing art skills to uh, work up a schematic for, for you all. Uh, there it is. And so for an individual fiber, which again is like a cellulose, so it's a plant, right? Uh, the discoloration, first of all, covers the entire cylinder, so all the way around but only on the outer 0.4 microns. So that seems pretty the, small. It is extremely small. So the there's just the very, very crust on the outside is colored. Uh, the inside part isn't colored, and there's a hollow part in this metal called the medulla that is also colorless. Okay, so if you open it up, there's no color in there. Contrast that with something like uh, there are places on the shroud that are burned because of the fire it was involved in, and the medulla for those things are colored. They're darkened. So that's, you know, so it wasn't done by someone just like scorching it because it wouldn't look like that. Okay. So this is very important. So I'm going to reiterate one more time. Threads, bundle of fibers, fibers, only the first two or three on the first one, two or three on the outside are colored. The actual colored fibers, the very little part, only the very outside edge. Okay. So the image itself is not made, the darkening is not made from differing shades of darkening. So you might think like the areas that are darker on the shroud, there's like the fibers are darker and that's why it looks darker. But that's not actually how it is. The image is actually a halftone. So this is what a halftone looks like. The dark areas on the screen, uh, on the top, the thing looks light. Like it's kind of a light shade. On the bottom is a darker shade, but the shade of white and black there haven't changed. If you look in the middle, down to the bottom, it's the same black, the same white. But because it's the density has increased, it looks darker, right? Same thing with the shroud. The areas that look darker are darker not because the fibers themselves are darker, but because there's more darkened fibers. So the fibers that are darkened are all the same hue, just about. And the fibers that are not darkened are also all the same hue. All right? Sure. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Uh, and the front and back image of the shroud about the same hue and density, okay? Finally, uh, when a colored thread goes under another thread, because it's like woven together, the color stops. It doesn't persist as it goes under. And finally, the, the blood stains on the shroud are probably actual blood. Um, we'll talk probably some of that next time, but uh, it's probably blood. And the image does not exist under the blood stain. So where there's a blood stain, there's no discolored fibers under there. So whatever happened um, didn't get through the blood if the blood was on there first or whatever. Okay. So these are the, the main characteristics of the shroud and the image on the shroud. So this has nothing to do with the thing. This is, 
these are the facts that we're dealing with, right? These right. are undisputed. Whether you think that the Shroud of Turin is the authentic burial cloth of Jesus, or you think it's a medieval forgery, or was dropped by aliens, or whatever, this is the Shroud as it exists. So this is what any hypothesis about image formation has to explain. All right. Now, there are just like so many hypotheses <laughs> about how these images got on the Shroud. We, I, This episode is probably, we haven't recorded all the way yet, obviously, but it's probably going to be more than an hour long, and that's cutting out a lot already. Okay, so I apologize in advance. We can't possibly cover it all. So I've tried to lump the more popular theories into like categories, and we're going to cover the best examples of each category. So up number one, explanation one is that a medieval artist did it with some kind of paint or stain, right? They paint it just like you'd expect an artist to do it. Okay. This was actually the first explanation that was posited in history. So with the shroud shows up, and again, we're going to cover most of this history in episode three, but the shroud shows up like for sure, no question in the 14th century in France. And the Bishop Pierre de Arcis, who's the Bishop of Troy, he wrote a letter to his Pope uh, saying that this was a forgery and it was done by a painter. And he knew it was done by a painter because his predecessor had wrung a confession out of the artist who had made it. Okay. So he, he put him to the question. <laughs> yeah. Or yeah. So this has this, uh, explanation for the shroud has been around basically as long as we've known the shroud has been around so what you're saying is since the shroud got on the scene or that we know it was people have been arguing about the authenticity of it for sure and we're yeah. continuing on to today so one champion of this model of the artist explanation was walter mccrone and he examined the shroud using extremely powerful microscopes and he found uh, vermilion and uh, red ochre which are pigments from the 14th century Okay, so th those would be dyes or things that an artist would use to paint stuff. And on the basis of this, he asserted, you know, so it's 14th century, and he actually made his assertion prior to the radiocarbon dating. So he was pretty happy when the radiocarbon dating came out and, you know, was in line with what he had been saying. So at first grant a glance, this is a simple explanation. It's pretty obvious. And so, like, that's good, right? It's great to have simple explanations problem is there's a lot of disconfirming pieces to this. So direct evidence of the fibers, and here I'm looking at the summary of Schwab and Robert, uh, Rogers, could find no evidence of liquid being absorbed. So you can see a picture there of the image, extremely faint. But if you look all the way down with the microscope, there's no liquid meniscus marks. And uh, for that, you can kind of imagine how liquid forms on a surface. You like drop some water on a countertop and it spreads out. But right at the edge, it's not like it gradually goes down. You've got like a little ledge. That's the meniscus there. Um, so you can imagine if that was on the fibers, you'd get that, the liquid kind of spreading out. But there'd be like an edge where it stops spreading, right? You don't see that on the shroud. Um, no fibers are cemented together. So like you don't have two fibers glued together with some kind of material, like if you had painted it. There's no evidence of brush strokes or any other marks of application. And also, remember, this is a half tone, right? When you're seeing those darker bits of brown there on the screen, it's not because the fibers themselves are any darker. There's just more darker threads, right? So um, it seems like that would be pretty hard for an artist to do. Also, the faintness itself makes it hard for an artist. So just looking at this, you're really up close. I tell you that it's dark and you can, you can see like some are dark, some are light, but it's really hard to like see that there's an image if you're close to this. Um, in fact, you have to, I haven't seen the shroud in person, but from those who have, uh, you have to be like a few meters away before you can really like see the image until then it just kind of looks like a kind of stained uh, piece of fabric. And part of that is because you, the way the human brain works, it's hard without that sharp uh, contrast to like see the whole image until you're way far away from it. Mm -hmm. And so, that doesn't necessarily preclude an artist from having done it. I mean, the artists have been super intelligent over the ages. Maybe figured out if there was an artist, maybe they figured a way around it, but it would be another obstacle in the way of the artist hypothesis. Right. Uh, so yeah, but Macron said he found dye, like he found particles of dye on the, the shot. So like what gives, right? Well, there's an alternative explanation to how those particles got there. Heller and Adler in 1981, they pointed out that artists have definitely painted images of the shroud, right? They've made copies throughout the ages, that's for sure. And they would do it in the uh, vicinity of the shroud sometimes, and sometimes they would like press the finished image with dry paint, but still 
painted image onto the Shroud of Turin to either bless it or to make sure they got it right or whatever. And even though the paint was dry, that could easily explain how some particles might transfer from one to the other, right? They also did examinations and they didn't find traces of like heavy uh, metals or a uh, large amount of pigment particles necessary for the, <clears throat> excuse me, for the image to be painted. Okay. So it could be though, maybe both were right. They're, they're, because Macron did find things that he thought was sufficient to say was painted, but he was mainly focusing on the blood. Heller and Adler were not focusing on the blood specifically, but they did. And while they found paint and stuff, they also found blood. Fanti and Zagato in 2017, they examined two sticky tape samples they got from the sh allegedly from the shroud. Uh, they were given to them on glass slides by Barry Schwartz, who's the photographer we mentioned last episode who kind of tracks all this stuff. So the chain of evidence isn't great, but let's just say for the sake of argument, it is authentic. Um, and when they analyzed it, they found both blood and dyes, cinnabar and red ochre. And their hypothesis was perhaps over the ages, uh, the blood parts were touched up. So they were kind of faded. And maybe artists came by and like painted over the bloody parts to make them look a bit more bright and cool, right? Make the holy relic a bit more holy, I guess. And that would explain the presence of both and would kind of meld those two hypotheses. So to sum all of that up, we're going to talk more about art and medieval art and how the shroud fits into that um, on the next episode. But if there was an artist involved, it seems they used a method a lot more sophisticated than just taking a brush to the shroud. Like they clearly didn't do that. So whatever they did, if an artist was involved, they used something more sophisticated than that. So it was obviously the miracle. Yeah, obviously the only explanation <laughs> is that Jesus rose from the dead in a cloud of fire. So, anyway, thanks for coming. Uh, no. <laughs> so the next class of explanations has to do with chemical reactions. Okay, so a couple mechanisms have been proposed, mainly by uh, Heller and Adler from before, or by our good friend Ray Rogers. Now, some people last time objected to our characterization of Rogers. Uh, we didn't apparently credit his genius sufficiently. So we're going to make up for that. By this time, he's going to take center stage, and he's going to be the hero of the story, okay? Uh, so our friend Ray, who was a chemist, he died in 2005, but he was a chemist, worked for Los Alamos. He proposed that uh, some of the chemicals from a dead body um, that would be wrapped in the shroud reacted with each other, and that led to a mired reaction, and that's what led to the fabric turning black, or not black, brown. So... The Myron reaction, you may know from cooking. It's a chemical reaction between amino acids and sugars. And if you've ever made cookies and they look you know, nice and golden brown, or if you sear a steak, then you've used the Myron reaction. It's like all over the place. Um, I'm not telling you to lick the Shroud of Turin. I don't think it would taste good. I'm just telling you to use it in cooking. So we know a bit of about how ancient linen was made, thanks to Pliny the Elder, who was a Roman who wrote long ago. And Rogers cites his information. Basically, when they were... Uh, Assembling the linen, the fibers were treated with a starch, and that includes sugars, uh, to protect it while they were you know, manipulating and weaving it. And then once they were done, they'd wash it with a soap. Rogers identifies a sup Supinoria officinalis as the specific candidate. I don't think it's known exactly what they would have used, but that's something that would be plausible that they could have used. Uh, and then after they washed it, they laid it out to dry. So soap, as you may know, is a wetting agent. It means it makes it easier for things to get wet. So if you, uh, by that, I mean, if you like dropped a drop of water on your car, if you wax it, it like beads up. So it's like a little ball, but if it's soapy, it spreads out. That's what it means by wetting. Okay. And so after the linen, which has been covered in the soapy solution is laid out to dry because it's a wetting agent, all of those delicious starches and sugars that have been on the shroud dry and then deposit themselves at the very top of the threads just a thin coating on the very outside so that's important because uh as you may remember the coloring on the shroud is just on the very outside so there you go the body that was wrapped in the shroud emits gases so when when you die you're going to emit gases lovely things like ammonia and some other things called uh, cadaverine and these gases are volatile and these volatile gases can react with sugars, the sugars that are on the linen, to produce a Maillard reaction. And that would lead to browning. And importantly, would lead to browning only on the surface. 
not all the way in. Okay. So we're talking chemical reactions here. Now, this is just a hypothesis for how the image was formed, right? Right. This, this is, yeah. uh, so he, in his writings, he puts out like a very formal hypothesis that basically summarizes what I just said. And there are distinct advantages to his idea. First of all, like it's a natural mechanism. So that's great. We don't have to posit some kind of supernatural layer to reality. That's cool. Uh, it's also been shown to work uh, like kind of at a mechanical level. Rogers ran an experiment. So he used linen made by a woman by the name of Kate Edgerton. She literally like grew her own flax and then used starch and saponora to uh, to wash it to try to make it as authentic to what it would uh, what ancient linen would have been as possible. He took us that sample that you see there on the screen and exposed it to ammonia vapor and a oh, brownie so he didn't actually kill somebody and put it he, over there. But... He did not <laughs> uh, brutally murder someone via crucifixion and then wrap them in, in this, well, this tiny is, little thing. Yeah. Right. This is mute. So things. there are limitations to his uh, experiment, but uh, there was a browning effect by treating with ammonia vapor um, consistent with the Meyer reaction and kind of, you can kind of see it looks a little bit like what's on the shroud, right? Um, so the browning effect was only on the surface images of the surface effect of the threads. He said, he uh, also said that it was consistent with it being a halftone image. Um, and the interior of the, the uh, fibers, the medulla, the hollow part in the middle was clear. So a lot of images, a lot, lot of boxes being checked. In uh, correspondence with other shroud researchers, he also claims that it's plausible that the gases from a body that be there, like laid in this uh, shroud, would um, have concentration gradients. They wouldn't be evenly distributed. They would concentrate in some places other than others. And that could give you the nice sharp image that we see. He also says that the gases would uh, have difficulty piercing like hair and stuff. So that's why you get like a lot of image there where the hair is. So all in all, got a lot of things going for it. But like you said, it is just a hypothesis and there are some problems. So first of all, Ray wasn't an expert on the Maillard reaction. He said, quote, it's much too complex for a physical chemist to follow. So he uh, published a paper with Anna Arnoldi, who I couldn't find anything about her, but presumably she is an expert because he, he pursued her for this uh, reason. Now, they published a peer-reviewed paper on this topic, but I can't actually find the original paper and I can't find the, the journal or the, the forum in which they published it, was the Proceedings of the European Cost Action 919 Melanoidins in Food and Health. It's funny, I found like the, the list of like of things, and it was all like food, 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 shroud of turn, food, 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 food. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this, so the cost actions uh, were funded by European nations as a network for scientific and technological research. And this one was funded for five years. I can't find much information on what level of peer review, if any, went into this. So this was a group of like scholars, experts in their field who are working together and kind of like tackling different problems and kind of sharing information with each other. So that leads me to believe this is more reliable than like something you'd pull off a blog spot or something. Right. But I can't yeah. say for sure how rigorous the peer review process here is. On top of that, it, this hasn't really been picked up a lot in the literature. I can only find two peer-reviewed papers that discuss this mechanism, and they're both pretty dubious. So the first is Kearse in 2020, a revised natural explanation for the Shroud of Turin image, creation of a composite Maillard reaction. And that was published in the Journal of Historical Archaeology and Anthropological Sciences. All sounds very impressive, right? Well, Kearse is evidently a high school science teacher. That's the like department he lists himself at, or they list themselves as. Uh, but worse than that, the journal is open access. So that means that the authors themselves, or the author in the singular in this case, have to pay the journal to publish them. Now, the upside of open access is that everyone can get it for free. You can just go get it. Open access, great. And open access doesn't necessarily mean bad. PLOS One is an open access journal, and it's generally well regarded. So it can be done well. But because they make their money by people paying them, it's basically pay to play it lends itself to predatory practices. And if you're interested in that, a uh, friend of the channel, Joel Duff, did a recent video on it. Link will be in the description talking about the problems with open access as, as a method of peer review. But the worst part about it, really, the thing that really sticks out to me is on every paper, if you've read a bunch of peer review papers at the top, it'll tell you like kind of the process it went through. 
when it was written, when it was submitted, when it was published, etc. This one was submitted to the journal on the 24th of November and then published thir- on the 30th. Six days. That's not mm. a lot of time, right? That's not a lot of time for someone who knows what they're talking about, who understands the material, to actually scrutinize it and determine if it's good. So it's it's not enough time for a good, rigorous peer review to happen. So this is a peer-reviewed journal, but there's some red flags that tell me that this might not be the most reliable research. Same goes for the second one, Fazio Mendaglio. Uh, could the turn shroud image be formation be explained by the Mayard reaction in Mediterranean archaeology and archaeometry? Same kind of thing. It's open access, submitted, published very quickly afterwards. And Fazio's work has been cited almost exclusively by Fazio which authors do cite themselves. If you do follow on research, you'll cite your previous paper, but it's not great if you're the only one citing yourself, you know, it shows that not a lot of people are like putting a lot of stock in your ideas. So. So if we're just recapping this section for the mayor mayored one, uh, it's a naturalistic explanation, right? Mm -hmm. So it would account for a, a good portion of the things that made the image. But what you found was that, uh, there's not a lot of research done on it and the stuff that has been done wasn't necessarily done in a, a peer reviewed fashion. There hasn't been any replication of the process to show it being duplicated, you know, a good hypothesis. You can replicate the experiment yeah. over and over, right. To and, get a realistic image of somebody. Right. And while, uh, he did take a sample of linen and like show yeah. kind of proof of concept, that is a definitely a long stretch from actually, showing that a guy wrapped in linen would Wait, with, produce this kind with of scourge marks, marks all over his body. Right? Yeah. So there's like a wide gulf between the hypothesis that he's put forward and showing it is actually in fact what happened. Right. right. So good idea, but I wouldn't necessarily put a ton of stock onto it yet. Right. Yeah. So now we're on to group three, which is the moment you've all been waiting for. It's time for some radiation. <laughs> and boy, am I excited about this. Uh, if you don't know, I'm a nuclear engineer which means I think radiation is super cool. And so I, <laughs> I've been reading a lot about it and uh, you're all going to hear it. So uh, one extremely popular set of explanations is that there was a s- burst of radiation from the uh, rising body or disappearing body of Jesus. And that in some way interacted with the linen of the Shroud of Turin. And that's what made the image. Okay. Before so we get into that, can you give us like a quick, just recap of like what radiation is for us who aren't nuclear engineers or don't study this stuff for fun. Well, I mean, if you twist my arm, <laughs> I guess I'll, I guess I'll talk more about radiation. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> here's a quick primer on radiation. Radiation is the collective name we give to particles that fly around off of things. They radiate from stuff and they sometimes interact with matter. Radiation can be a lot of different things. It can be photons. So light gamma rays and x-rays. You've probably heard of those. Those are very high energy bits of light. Okay. Same kind of same light that you see with, it's just higher energy. They can also be charged particles like electrons or positrons. Those are called beta particles. Helium nuclei, so like the helium, just the nucleus part. Those are called alpha particles, and they can also be protons. And uh, as a reminder, uh, the atom is composed in the nucleus in the center bit of neutrons and protons, which are massive particles. They're big and bulky. Neutrons have no electrical charge. Protons have a positive charge about the same but opposite as an electron. Okay. And the radiation can be those neutrons. Those can also be a form of radiation. Charged particles like those beta and alpha particles I mentioned, they're called directly ionizing radiation. So because they're charged, when they like shoot through your body, they're, that electrical interaction with all the atoms around them can cause damage on the way. And when they get absorbed, that can cause damage. And ionizing is bad, is all you really need to know. Ionizing is bad for you. Um, Neutrons are indirectly ionizing. They don't have an electric charge, but they just smash into things really heavy, which can do do damage and eject protons, which then go on to ionize. So all you really need to know is there are different kinds of radiation. Some are charged, some are not, and they do damage to biological material when they go through it. Radiation in its simplest form is just particles radiating away from something. Right, exactly. Just going through other things potentially. Right. And uh, radiation has to, it goes through space. Um, If it's traveling through a medium, it needs energy to get through that medium. So like if a proton is flying through the air, the air is not empty. There's gases floating around. So it's going to be like interacting with all those things on the long way. And how far 
uh, radiation will go depends on what it's trying to get through, what kind of radiation is. But as a general rule, the more energy the radiation has, the farther it'll go. Just like if you had a ball and you threw it, the harder you throw it, the farther it'll go. You can kind of think of it losing energy as it goes, just like a ball loses energy from air resistance or whatever. Okay? So that's what radiation is. Jared is going to be your voice of the layman to make sure I don't get too in the weeds. <laughs> uh, so let's yeah. talk to how this relates to the Shroud of Turin. So the idea, the basic idea, is that some sort of radiation does damage to the cellulose, which uh, is what the Shroud is primarily made of, and that leads to discoloration via dehydration of the cellulose or oxidation or something like that. Okay. The usual suspects are some sort of light, often uh, ultraviolet rays, or protons. Those are the two main... Uh, ones and then neutrons are said to play a role as well. The radiation is somehow emitted from the body of Jesus. Um, and like I said, there's tons of permutations, but let's start with the protons. Okay. So protons being emitted from Jesus dehydrate the, the exterior of the fibers. They cause a discoloration. Now the good news is protons can do damage to linen in this way. Um, and it might produce a discoloration kind of like what you see on the shroud. Now, allegedly, there have been experiments done to this effect by one John Baptiste Renato in 1999. I see all kinds of references to him working. I see nowhere where his stuff is published. Any like I, I scoured the internet, couldn't find it published anywhere. Okay, so I, I saw like images. I saw people like doing presentations on it. I couldn't find it, so I can't critique it or tell you how reliable it is or anything. But the fragments I saw looked promising enough they kind of look yeah here's linen here's after i shot it with a proton it's discolored right okay so you just get your proton gun yeah and then yeah exactly then... just like ghostbusters exactly yeah. uh so i kind of at just a very fundamental level maybe it would work right but there's a lot of problems with this model so to start with the protons would need to have a very specific band of energy right so this is what a situation we're looking at, just as a reminder. The protons are flying off of Jesus' body. They hit this thread. They need to be absorbed in just the first few uh, fibers, but never further, never further than three, right? So they need enough energy to go that far, but no further. Now, believe it or not, it was actually pretty hard to find information on protons penetrating into cellulose. I know, seems like the kind of thing you should just be able to Google, <laughs> but it was pretty tough. But uh, I remembered that proton therapy is a thing, and so I found a paper by that by Neuhauser and Zhang, and that led me to a neat program called SRIM. And what that does is you give it a proton energy profile, and you say what you're shooting it into, and it'll tell you how far the protons will go. So I did that, and I came up with a picture there on the screen, just kind of give you a visual idea. You've got your proton energy on the bottom in kiloelectron volts. What's a kiloelectron volt? It's a unit of energy. You don't. It doesn't matter what it's that many units of energy, that's how you measure the energy of particles. The important thing is you can see as the energy goes up, it uh, just penetrates further. If you get to about, uh, to if you get to a certain level of energy, a little bit over a mega electron volt, you can get down to the third fiber, okay? So what you're saying is we know how far, in this theory, we know how far the energy would have, in quotation marks, penetrated the fibers because we see the discoloration on those fibers. Right. And so knowing this, we can calculate how much energy would have been right. used in this process, right? We know what fibers are discolored, so we can infer if it were protons, what energy they'd need to be able to get that far, but not get farther. Gotcha. And this is what that energy profile would look like. But there's a problem with this. So this model has the protons coming in, plowing through the first, second, and ending on the third fiber sometimes. Sometimes they're absorbed in the first, sometimes the second, sometimes the third, right? But if we flip over to the zoomed in view of the uh, of just the fibers themselves, you may remember I told you that the coloration was only on that very outer bit, right? Only the first 0. 0.4 microns. So why is it that the protons that are flying in from the outside either hit the front 0. 0.4 microns or the back 0. 0.4 microns and never anything in between? Like how it's, do they it's wrapping around? It's going around it. it, it it's like hitting it, like skidding, <laughs> like Tokyo drift around the side. Yeah, yeah. I, I like the skid marks of the proton or what's causing the dehydration. No, that's not how protons work, obviously. <laughs> um, so it seems to me like what what I would expect, not knowing anything about cellulose, what I'd expect is you'd have your most interactions right at the front, and you'd get a gradient as you went in further deeper. Not not a. It's not 
exactly like darkest the lightest because of reasons they do most protons do most of their damage right before they stop so like if they usually go say five microns in you'd see most damage five microns in but in any case i wouldn't expect them to like hit a bunch of stuff then stop hitting stuff then hit a bunch of stuff then stop hitting stuff then hit a bunch of stuff like 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 i wouldn't expect these like very specific hit regions on a variety of, of fibers right now maybe maybe there's some kind of mechanism such that the protons are being absorbed all throughout it but that only manifests on the very outermost 4.4 microns i couldn't see such a me proposed mechanism around but i don't know that'd be a problem with the model that would need to be solved okay. another way you might solve it though is i told you like the penetration depth is proportional energy, right? And it can only go 0.4 microns. What if they're just really, really slow protons? What if instead of the, uh, you know, the 400 kilo electron volts to like a mega electron volt, what if instead of that, they're really slow? So they're like about 12 kilo electron volts and that would only penetrate about that 0.4 microns. It's, there you go. Would that still explain the Tokyo drift around the fiber though? Well, I mean, maybe like the protons are coming in. So like the the, the top like semicircle of the the fiber that makes sense because like the protons are coming in, so right. hit, right? And sometimes maybe they like go in, but they like forgot something. They wanted to go back to the body, and they like so they like, turn around and hit the backside. They of the went to the fiber. quantum realm real quick, and they right, came back. Yeah. Yeah. No, it doesn't really explain why the backside of the fibers okay. would also be colored. Um, but even worse than that, while the the shroud would be like on Jesus' face sometimes. You know, it's also draped on the body. So not every part of the image would have been in contact with the skin, right? So that means the protons have to travel through some air to get to the shroud. Mm. But if they're going to be low enough energy that they'll only penetrate the outer 0.4 microns, they don't have enough energy to move that space, okay? Now, that if for that to work, then you'd have to have a finely tuned profile of proton energies such that where the where the the fabric is touching the skin the protons are low energy so they don't penetrate too far but at the neck energy here it's higher so it can bridge that gap right right it can bridge the gap but be the right energy level when it gets to the shroud and so like the energy is like Ooh. finely tuned, like a map around the thing maybe i mean this is a miracle here but it seems that seems to be stretching the the explanation quite a bit right yeah and, and like you said the this is the dematerialization of Jesus's body would be a miracle, but the radiation theory hypothesis is all naturalistic mechanisms after that point. So Right. So they posit the source of this radiation is miraculous, but then they want to say, okay, we've got this radiation. Then what happens? That's how they're using right. it to explain us on the shroud, right? So yeah. Um, one quick point on UV radiation, because um, we're talking about depths of fibers. Uh, that's another kind of particle that's used. And a lot of the same problems apply. Why would it hit only the front part and the back part, but nothing in between? Um, why would a beam of UV radiation skip over the interior such that it wouldn't discolor the inner medulla? Um, you can see an example of this done by Baldacini et al. in 2008. So they shot some linen with ultraviolet radiation and kind of superficially zoomed out. It looked kind of like the, sh the shroud, but if you look inside, this is a cross, like a longitudinal cut of uh, some of the threads. You can see exactly what you'd expect. Darker at the top, gets gradually lighter as you go, as the UV uh, radiation is not penetrating as far, right? So um, I couldn't find anywhere in that paper where they said whether the medulla was colorless. I expect if it was, they would have said something. But anyway, regardless, while these are superficially like the uh, the coloration you see, it doesn't seem like to really match all of the facets you'd need to reprograde the shroud. So it doesn't seem like UV radiation is a good candidate, and there are some real problems with proton radiation. Gotcha. Um, another problem with proton radiation, uh, you are talking about it being natural, right? Well, something that radiation does is it travels isotropically. And what that means is mm -hmm. it travels about equally in all directions. If you've got like a, a thing, a chunk of stuff that's that's decaying, then the radiation is about equal in every direction because every atom is going to spit it out in a random direction. And the if you just randomize all these things, it's going to roughly equal to the same everywhere. It's not it doesn't have any preference for up or down. Right. Right. And so if <clears throat> if this is the body and this is the thing, you're this image over here is going to be affected by this. Also, this one. So it's 
But what the yeah. image looks like is it was a direct hit, and this is like, but you right. have images from all right. over, right? If you had the the shroud, um, ours looks like perfectly vertical, but and there's it would actually be like this because it's draped on the dude's head. Right. But there's nothing over here. There's no image on the side. So if it was actually radiation, you'd expect it to go into every direction, and you'd have uh, some burning. I'm going to call it burning, it's not burning, but some like darkening around the sides of this dude's torso. It would right? basically make a less sharp image because it would be like a blurred. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so that's what radiation would do. But don't worry. They thought of this and they have a solution. See, uh, this radiation <laughs> is special radiation. See, this radiation is vertically collimated. Ooh. Yeah. Is that Vertic a thing? That's... No. Not okay. A thing. Well, <laughs> that's not true. It is. a. Th we can make vertically collimated radiation. Right, we can like do things to make to filter out the the radiation not going in the direction. But you're you putting physical barriers around something at that you, point, you, right? Yeah, we yeah. are doing something to make radiation vertically collimated. It just radiation in nature doesn't do that. So, like, but what mechanism is uh, making this radiation vertically collimated? Well, I'm going to tell you to stop asking questions, you naturalist <laughs> fanatic. You know, <laughs> this is a miracle, and you're showing your bias. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. Why is it vertically collimated? I don't know, because. So, <laughs> right. well, you might be wondering, I can hear it in your mind, you're wondering, now all of this makes sense and is super interesting and radiation is the best, but where does all these protons come from anyway? Where are we getting all these protons? Well, I'm glad you asked, person that didn't ask anything. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I thought you were a, asking me for a second, I was like, I don't know. Like, <laughs> there's a solution to this too, and this is where we're going to go to Robert Rucker's vertically collimated radiation burst hypothesis or the vcrb uh so this is a hypothesis that takes some the reason that this is going to bear directly on the radiocarbon dating that we talked about last time but the reason we didn't talk about it last time one that was already pretty long and also it was going to like we're talking a lot about radiation here so kind of fit here but right. if you haven't seen the first episode you should probably go watch it but just in case you're unfamiliar forgot uh the radiocarbon dating the way it works is all living things plants and stuff like what those shrouds made of there's radioactive carbon 14 in them they absorb it from the atmosphere you can measure the amount of radiocarbon 14 in there to plain old carbon 12 that's like what normal carbon is and see like the ratio because carbon 14 is going to go away over time it's radioactive it's destroying itself so when the thing dies it's going to have this much and it'll gradually get less and less and less as it goes right and so if you see that ratio you can know how old something is okay but that doesn't work if the carbon-14 didn't come from the atmosphere. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> right. <laughs> so Damon et al. published the radiocarbon dating in 1989, which we talked about last time. Our friend Rucker, who is probably watching this right now because he was in the comments last time. So, hey, uh, Rucker read, it, read this paper in dismay because he knew the shroud was authentic. And that's his words. I'm not making this up. These are his words that he said in an interview like two weeks ago. So the radiometric dating, it had to be wrong. But for reasons I won't go into, he didn't think that the measurements themselves were wrong. Like he believed that when they measured this specific ratio of 14 to 12, they were right. So he thinks that the actual measurements on the shroud are what they were, but they're not showing an age because they're being artificially inflated. Okay. So being a nuclear engineer like myself, he naturally thought of neutrons, as one does. Specifically, he remembered that nitrogen-14, if it absorbs a neutron, it turns into carbon-14. Okay? So if Jesus' body emitted a bunch of neutrons, then that would generate a bunch of extra carbon-14. And because if you have more carbon-14, you look younger, right? If the shroud has more carbon-14 than it should, it might date younger, perhaps in the 14th century, even though it's actually a first century thing. All right. So the shroud is in this scenario, a bank account. All right. And when Jesus dematerialized, he deposited a surplus of money into this bank account. And then it slowly, so like it slowly started going away. So like, kind does of, that make well, sense? Like, yeah. Uh, think of it this way. Think of the amount of stuff you have, like you have a tub, okay? You have mm -hmm. a, a tub, and at the bottom is a hole that drains at a predictable rate, okay? And if we know the tub was halfway full when it started, and we know how much it's drained out, we can look at any point and see how much is left, and we know how long That's it's been. 
carbon 14 dating. That's the carbon 14. In, in this method, right. he's saying Jesus put extra water in the tub. Right. It started way over fold from where it normally would be. And, and so, so we're looking at we it and we're thinking it, yeah. it's, it's from the 14th, 14th century. But in fact, it's a lot older because it started with extra water. And it just so happens that the amount of water just put the, into the 14th century when the shroud appeared. That, that, that's a coincidence at that point. Yeah, definitely a coincidence that was intentional by God to throw us off the that's my interpretation of his <laughs> yeah he doesn't say that i just wanted to make sure i understood what was was happening right. here so so uh he did a bunch of math and some simulations particularly uh he ran a program called mcnp which stands for monte carlo n particle the n is for neutron uh that is a software used by the nuclear industry to simulate how neutrons act when they fly around a medium usually that medium is a nuclear reactor but you could use it for anything uh, this is extremely good software. It's been vetted over decades. It's, it's so good, in fact, that when they use these kind of modeling, like to say, here's what the power output of the reactor should be, and it's wrong, they're pretty sure there's something wrong in the reactor, not the model. Gotcha. So <laughs> it, it's really well vetted. So, And he used that to simulate the release of these neutrons. So he started by assuming the body is releasing neutrons homogeneously, which means just from everywhere in the body. The whole body is emitting neutrons. Um, and these are special neutrons, just like the protons were before. They're vertically collimated, so they're only going up. Why? Don't worry about it. So uh, these are also thermalized neutrons. That's fancy language for saying they're slow, which in this context means 2,200 meters per second. Still pretty fast, but not fast on the scale of neutrons. And that corresponds to an energy of 0.025 electron volts. Real quick. Um, I want to make sure that people understand that when you keep saying, don't worry about the vertically collimated stuff, like it's not because you're being flippant. It's because there is no explanation for it. Correct. Correct. There is okay. no mechanism. Yes. There, there, there is no answer. I just don't it, want people to think you're just like waving off one of their explanations and not going no. into it. I'm not waving off an explanation that they have. I'm pointing out there is no explanation. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so he produced uh, a graph of what the age would look like. There it is. And so if the body's like emitting radiation from all of it, basically what you'd expect, where there's more body, there's more radiation, which meets a younger age, or in this case, an age that would look in the future because it's got like way more water than even water than our tubs do today. Carbon 14. Carbon 14, exactly. So from this model, he calculates an amount of neutrons that had to be flying through. And there you go. There's this hypothesis. So he proclaims that his hypothesis matches the only four data points we have. And this is a selling point. One, it matches the radiocarbon dating of the shroud, putting it in the 14th century in one spot, right? Only one portion of the shroud was, was measured, and that portion matches his hypothesis, right? Uh, there was a systemic error in the shroud, which we talked about last time. Basically, um, if you just plotted the different dates of the That was labs, the slope, right? They would make a slope, and it looks like it's getting younger as you go further towards the center. We'll talk about more of all of this in a second. Um, it matches the range of dates. And finally, there's another piece of cloth, the Sudarium of Avedo, which is allegedly the face covering of Jesus. That was radiometric, radiometrically dated to 670 CE. And Rucker says that the shroud was in this specific pot, spot in the tomb, and that matches that. There you go. So before I go into the problems with all of this, I just want to say up front, in his written work, Rucker is very careful to say that this is a hypothesis, and the point of a hypothesis is to make testable predictions. And to be fair, this hypothesis does exactly that. It makes some very firm predictions. Like if you made a measurement anywhere else on the shroud, either it's going to have ridiculously high carbon-14 levels or it won't, right? And his model requires it does, and it even tells you about how many. In fact, there's so much carbon-14 there at the middle where like it was showing it would be 8,400 years in the future, that corresponds to about 300% of modern carbon. You wouldn't even need to do radiocarbon dating to the you just look at it, right? You could just like wave a Geiger counter at it. Like yeah. go somewhere with, with with like filtering out most of the background radiation, and you could just use a Geiger counter to say is it super elevated or not. That would be enough to pretty much falsify this idea, and it would be non-destructive, which would be nice. No one's done it yet, obviously. Not that that's Rucker's fault, but nobody, yeah. Next time um, I'm in turn, I'm just gonna whoop. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and in addition to making testable predict predictions in terms of like his math and like his modeling, like I said, that all seems fine. Um, the most of the work is being done to show like if you bombard something with nitrogen in it, 
you'll get carbon 14 that's just like obviously true if you know what you know how this thing works like if you if you tell me you have a block of nitrogen and you're going to throw neutrons at it you'll get carbon 14 that's just that's just how these things work okay this you may begin into this but this seems like we're working backwards here yes what's happening here is that this hypothesis the problem with it is that it is completely utterly and fully ad hoc it is starting at the endpoint and working backwards okay? okay so where are these neutrons coming from ruckers posits that the neutrons are coming from deuterium fission deuterium is hydrogen that has a pro uh, neutron attached to it so hydrogen is just a proton right with an electron spinning around it if you add a neutron to that it's heavy water or it's heavy hydrogen okay they call it deuterium and so if it splits apart if it breaks if it fissions you have neutron and proton what was in there before right deuterium doesn't really fission in nature it's super stable so it had to be forced to fission and usually when we're forcing deuterium to do something we're forcing it to fuse um because that actually emits energy right uh so making it fission is tough but hey we're in miracle territory already so hey i guess the that's where the energy comes from fine he says that only a very small number of the deuterium will fission in fact, it's 0.0004% of the deuterium fissions. Now, he touts this as a good thing. My question is, like, why 0. 0.0004? Why not, like, 0. 0.005 or 0. 0.003? It's, so my guess here is that 0. 0.0004 is the number you need to get to the end for the answer right. he wants. Exactly. Why is it 0. 0.004? Mm -hmm. Because that gives him the answer he wants. That's why. Okay. You know? <laughs> uh when the thing's vision, like we said, I've hit this before. It doesn't go randomly in all directions. It's vertical. Why is it special? Because that gives him the answer he wants. That's why. Uh, the neutrons are thermalized already. Remember, that means that they're low energy. Uh, so that they, they had to be ejected. This fission had to happen with the absolute minimum energy. Because energy isn't created or destroyed. So like, if you throw in energy at this thing, if there was like extra, say it needed five units of energy, and you give it eight, then the other three would be the energy of the proton and neutron flying away. Okay. Um, and he actually says one of the the uh, the benefits of it is the fact you get a proton neutron. Now, why is it minimum energy? Why is it why are these thermalized neutrons not some other energy level? Who knows? No, no particular reason. They could be anything. Um, but a proton and neutron have almost the exactly the same mass. Not quite, but very very close. And so there's no real reason why one of them would get more energy out of this reaction than the other. They're they're like also one's electrically neutral. Um, so just kind of thinking about it, I would expect you'd have roughly at the same energy for both of them. Sometimes the proton will get a little more. Sometimes the neutron will get a little more, but overall, if your neutrons are thermalized at their 0.025 electron volts, you'd expect your protons to be about that too. Right. Okay. But that doesn't work because if the protons are that low range, remember low energy means it doesn't go very far. And at that low energy, we're talking like one atom's length. It's going next door to the next atom. Like it's not going far at all. No Tokyo drift here. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, so like that doesn't work at all. You can't have, unless he has some way to preferentially give the protons energy, that that just doesn't work. You get no protons from that reaction, except maybe on the very, very outer surface. Okay. So these protons need energy so that they can escape the body, but they can't be too high energy because if they were too high energy, they just burn right through the shroud, right? And we need them to be stopped right in the edge. Okay, so I'm just going to like workshop. Let's workshop some solutions to try to figure out how this could work. Right. But so imagine maybe all of the particles just come from the very surface of the skin. So they don't need to like penetrate anything. Right. So they can just like there's plenty of deuterium in the hydrogen bonds in the surface of your skin. You don't need very many. So the, the very topmost layer of Jesus skin fissions, shoots the particles only upwards. There you go. And they're at the right energy distribution or whatever. But that doesn't work. Because he needs way more neutrons than he needs protons, orders of magnitude more. Okay. He needs some of the protons to go away because if there's too many protons, you wouldn't get the image we see. Okay. And so he has said in places that only about 20% of the protons would escape. Um, I don't know where he's getting this 20% number from. I can't find any math on it, whatever. Um, but he he needs uh he, he needs some of them to escape or to be filtered out in order for it to work, right? Um, so he needs there to be some layer of human body between the surface where the protons can escape and where they're coming from. 
So basically what it would need to be is they need to be finely tuned, just, just, just the right amount of flesh to filter out just the right amount of protons with just the right amount of the energies so then it could then cross the airway and then make the image. Um, so, <laughs> okay. Yeah. But hey, again, we're in Miracle Land. So <laughs> maybe, right? Uh, Rutgers has said in interviews that the strengths of his hypothesis is that it matches all the data, right? Um, and while this is true, in fact, he, he, the word he used, uh, was that it's astonishing. It's astonishing. It matches this. It should be astonishing to absolutely nobody because that's the input to his model. And this, if you take nothing else away from this very long diatribe on radiation, understand this Rucker's model has no value because all of the known data points are inputs to his model. It cannot help, but to match them. Do you remember that curve from before? that showed mm -hmm. like the carbon 14 date, there's no mechanism to tell him the number of neutrons. All he knows is that it must yield 1260 at this one spot. And so he does his simulation and then normalizes his, his curve. So it automatically agrees to the first requirement. That's his words, automatically agrees to the first requirement, right? So it literally doesn't matter what the result of his MCNP calculations are, whatever they yielded, it would match the data because he's forcing it to match the data. The exact same thing is true of that face cloth I mentioned briefly. He's like, oh, look, the dating matches the face cloth. It was over on the right side of Jesus' body. He uses this picture. So if the, the thing were right there, his calculations show it would have the right date of 670. Why is it right there? We don't know where it was. We don't know if it was in there at all. It may not be authentic in, at all. But if it was authentic, who the heck knows where in this tomb it was? Why is it right there? Simple, because that gives him the answer he wants. That's why he put it there. He put it there because that's the answer he wants to yield. So that's where it goes. Like the amount of neutrons that he's getting. How many? Why is it 0.04? It's finely tuned. All of this is backward, is working backwards with the data we have to fit the data that we know. And while he says it's just a hypothesis, and that is true, people are taking this as a solution. And he wrong rightly or wrongly, inadvertently, on purpose, doesn't matter. He portrays it as if it's like this is a workable solution this is just fault he says this is just following the evidence where it leads it's just following the evidence where it leads no this is beating the evidence down with a crowbar beating it unconscious tying it up and dragging it to where you want it to go that's what this is this is ignoring everything we know about how radiation is emitted this is ignoring uh various problems with it, how it would be absorbed this is ignoring problems with the ratio of protons and neutrons this is ignoring all of that and just forcing it to fit the things you want it to force, the fit to fit what you want, right? Now, it does make those testable predictions, but unless until those testable predictions have in fact been tested, nobody should put one picogram of certainty on this thing. It is completely and utterly useless as an explanation until that happens. I want to interject here because for somebody like me who is a layman in this area and not an expert, when I looked at some of Rucker's things, like I literally have no grasp of it and I need to use metaphors like bathtubs with water to try to understand this. Right. So if I'm somebody who is on the fence or if I'm like a shroud um, supporter in the authenticity of it and Rucker comes along with some of this stuff and it, it's like, oh, my gosh, it may seem very convincing to me. And then I'm just going to go out there and spew this stuff out again, not completely understanding. it. I think that's what we have here is is going on is it's very technical language technical stuff i don't have this program i can't run these calculations you know so i mean to be honest you probably didn't need to you could just approximate it as a thin plate but now that you can do that <laughs> right yeah uh, <laughs> so i get it like this is actually pretty hard to like really dig in there and see but yeah. i think most people can kind of just like do this thought experiment think of what the information we're trying to explain here is uh, if we pull up the image from last time, we're talking about the slope. These are the dates uh, that were on the cloth. You can see the the hollow box in the middle. That's the average of the dates, the mean for that particular lab. You have three labs, right? So mm -hmm. Tucson and Zurich are a little bit off, but very close. They kind of overlap. You know, they're pr pretty in line. And then Oxford is off on its own, right? So if you plot three data points like this, you get a slope, okay? Uh, but what Rutgers is doing 
is from this phenomena of having two points that are almost horizontal, one point up here, therefore you have a slope. He's saying, okay, there is in fact actually a slope. The radiocarbon does slope. And from that, he's draw he's like extrapolating. He's extrapolating out to the origination yeah, point, like in the middle this, somewhere. Yeah. He's, and to explain this data, he uses that entire Rube Goldberg level hypothesis I just spent, I don't know how long, 20 minutes or more, trying to explain. And it was still confusing, I'm sure, for anyone who doesn't think about radiation all day. Right. That extremely elaborate hypothesis is an explanation or or what if Oxford was 0.7 percent better at eliminating contaminant because they had different uh, lab cleaning methods, which they did. Oxford had slightly different cleaning methods than the other two, which were, it seems, slightly better. They look like they would be slightly better. And all you need is 0.7 percent more contamination cleaned by Oxford. And it explains everything. And this is what we talked about last time when we said it takes it from a heterogeneous sample to a homogeneous. Oh, right. Right. Yeah. The problem with this sample is there is a systemic bias. It is heterogeneous. There is some, what that tells you, what this is telling you is not that there is in fact a sloping age. What it's telling you is that you can make it a, a correlation between the distance and age. And you shouldn't be able to do that if there was nothing weird going on between these labs. So there's something strange. There is some relation between its position and the age what is that relation probably which lab because the, if they did it in sequence like one lab's on the bottom next lab next lab next lab right the mm -hmm. the, the, the samples are vertical right so there there is no reason to go to this massive it just insane insane level of effort to explain this completely mundane observation now if they do another dating and if they like do it around the center and it dates to 8,000 years in the future, well, then I guess I'll apologize to Rutger and say he was right all <laughs> along. But until that happens, yeah, this is not impressive. It shouldn't be impressive to anybody. And Good luck them taking a cut out of right of Jesus' face. Let me just get this piece right you, here. You could do it anywhere. You could do a measurement anywhere. No, I'm just joking. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> also, as a side bonus, um, you've probably heard of the Invisible Reweave. We talked about that in the first episode. This hypothesis is contradictory with that. The, the two cannot coincide. So if you're a sharp opponent, you have to pick one. They both can't be true. So that's it. That's all of the main classes of image hypotheses. You've had to sum up. You had your artist hypothesis, hypothesis that someone painted it. There were issues with not seeing paint, not seeing the, the markers of paint and that sort of thing. So if they used, if an artist did do it, he didn't do it with paint. You had the chemical reaction, which has a nice natural pathway and it seems plausible, but it hasn't been demonstrated to actually like work. And it hasn't been scrutinized a lot in the peer reviewed literature. So definitely problems there. And then you have the radiation hypothesis, which is ad hoc from start to finish and completely nuts. You know, it, it ignores a ton of problems and basically any any kind of obstacle is just waved away as a miracle. And then they're mm -hmm. just the one thing we can say for sure is that we don't know how the image was made. And that's that is the takeaway everyone should take. That that is the key point. The answer to how was the image on the strata turn made, we don't know. But we don't know does not mean therefore I do know and it was God. Like that's <laughs> not what that means. It means we don't know. Right. Right. Yeah. And it just if so, these are the I'm sure there's somebody out there. Well, what about this? Like, there's probably other explanations, right? But these are the main hypotheses for how the the image was made. To me, it seems more probable that it was a natural method, and that some sort of artistic representation or, or method was used. That seems more probable than neutrons making extra carbon fourteen, right? Like, I don't. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it. it... If I had to pick, um, I would throw I throw the radiation in the trash immediately because that's just completely implausible. Mm -hmm. um, from there, I'd be left with either some kind of natural thing. So either it was a natural mechanism that happened to a first century thing, which I don't think it happened. So probably it was a natural mechanism or an artistic rendering or some combination of the two in the 14th century, if I had to guess. But yeah. the reasons why we're going to guess that, because you're probably yelling, but what about this painting? What about the prayer codex what about all this other stuff well i got good news for you because we are not done we are going to cover all of that too uh in our time it's going to be like in 30 minutes when we record it but we're going to make you wait a week so uh make sure you hit that subscribe button 
put on the little bell and you'll be notified when that episode comes out. Again, we are only human. Please check our sources. We'll list them all in the description. And if we made a mistake, please do comment. We'll read it. If we're wrong, we'll put in the pinned comments and we'll make sure everybody knows about it because we don't want to spread misinformation inadvertently. Uh, oh. <laughs> yeah. So we made it this part in the podcast, right? So we need to treat as, our guests. If you right. made it this far, you need a little treat. So gold star. And as a reward, you get to learn about a fallacy. Today's fallacy, well, kind of a fallacy. Today's fallacy of the day is the rescue device. It's otherwise okay, done, making stuff up. <laughs> yeah. With the ad hoc hypothesis, which we talked about a little bit. So what a rescue device is, it basically, it occurs when a flaw is found in somebody's idea. They've got this idea. And they're like, hey, here's my idea. And someone's like, well, what about this? And so they come up with another idea to rescue it, to like save it from this terrible fact that was brought to their attention. Uh, so, for example, my neighbor Fred, you know, he went on, he's been gone for two weeks. He must have been kidnapped by the cartel, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but then you find out that he was posted that he was on vacation in Europe. Oh, well, obviously the cartel hacked his account and they've put on this picture to throw us off the scent. But Jordan, I just spoke to Fred and he said he was fine. So. Ah, well, they must be using some of that AI technology to <laughs> fake Fred's voice. You know? <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so any theory, and I mean any theory, can be fit, can fit the evidence if you're willing to throw enough nonsense at it. If you're willing to throw enough ad hoc elements, like say, oh, why is there an image on the side? Because this radiation magically goes up and down. Why? Don't worry about it. Uh, so like if you're willing <laughs> we're to not saying that anything we presented here is nonsense. You make the decision. Yeah, well, yourself. You, you <laughs> draw whatever conclude. We probably did already call it nonsense, yeah, but it yeah. doesn't matter anyway. Uh, so something ad hoc uh, necessarily reduces the likelihood that your theory is true. Yes. The ad hoc thing, the key point about it is, is not an evidence anywhere. You have this thing. The only evidence for it is the thing you're trying to explain, right? And so unless you can find some other supporting piece of evidence, like in our silly example of my kidnapped neighbor, if there was like blood on his floor and a ransom note from the cartel, like, okay, well, now it's not ad hoc anymore, right? It's actual evidence. <laughs> exactly, yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. So... And another note, this is not the same as like coming up with ideas for later testing. Like um, it's fine to like speculate, well, what if this were true? What would we expect to see? Like that's not being ad hoc. Hypothesis generating is fine, but you don't rely on hypotheses as explanations until you've tested them. That's the key, right? It's fine to come up with a hypothesis. It's fine to come up with an idea. It's fine to be crazy. You know, that that's no problem. It's, it's cool to be creative when you're doing a hypothesis, but you shouldn't say, okay, I came up with an idea, therefore it's right. And then just go on. I hope you enjoyed this episode. This was a deep one. I want to thank Jordan too for the amount of research he did and for bringing some of his expertise to this episode because I know I could not have done it. Uh, and I really appreciate that that we have somebody on this the show who has that kind of expertise. So good. I'm glad that at least one person on the planet has appreciated my effort thus far. <laughs> Mission accomplished. Uh, okay, so that's the episode. Join us next time where we're going to talk about the art history and the other stuff about the Shroud, and hopefully that'll be our last one. Please, for the love of God. <laughs> Until then, remember, you've always got reason to doubt. Peace out.